Welcome to another lively edition of The Deadly Experiment right here on this television facility that you're watching, whether it's Cox or Verizon. Welcome back to another program. Rick Adams, your producer. Scott Smith is on a, well, a very slight, not long, but a slight hiatus as he's on business and very well may turn up somewhere on the planet where we least expect. He might even be in the Middle East. Who knows? But he will be back with me, Rick Adams, to continue our weekly excursion through the minefields of life on this program. Last week, we got into the scriptures heavily as you know, and the reason was I'm trying to set the tone for what we are seeing here in America today. Everything that's political, everything that's economic, everything that's academic, everything that's medical now is all tied together in a pattern of the end of our free nationhood. And a lot of you don't understand that. I realize that most people are probably uninitiated in these areas because they have never been told the truth. The media have been a vessel of lies for as long as I can remember reading about the media. I mentioned the late Walter Cronkite toward the end of last week's program as a classic illustration of a man who sat amongst the mighty in the ivory towers of media control and yet used the power, used the power of the mic, the power of the camera to deceive and lie. I know some of you out there, you devils, you are saying, aren't you doing the same thing? You Rick Adams and Scott Smith, you're deceivers, you're liars. That's your choice. You can believe whatever you want to believe. The reality is we can prove what we say, as we do every week on this program, the deadly experiment. The fact of the matter is that America has been a nation that has been enslaved to powerful criminal enterprises from the very beginning of the 20th century. A classic illustration is an organization that was set up during the administration of Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was reelected in 1916 on a campaign of no war in Europe, and yet because of the compromise situation of Woodrow Wilson, whom Zionists themselves had found he had a mistress by the name of Peck. Woodrow Wilson was actually blackmailed into supporting America's entry into that ungodly war in which a quarter of a million American men gave their lives. That war, of course, was dubbed the war to end all wars. And of course, we know, while that was being said, already plans were being laid to create another more evil, more devastating war worldwide. And that's exactly what happened. How did it happen? How did America surrender her sovereignty in 1918, 19, 20, and 21? How did it do that? by getting into war after two other important changes took place in America. What were they? One was the enactment of the Federal Reserve System in 1913, a system that was foisted on the American public when they had absolutely no clue as to what was happening to their monetary system a group of international bankster gangsters, criminals who had ties to financial institutions in Europe, the same people that have brought about world conflict for hundreds and hundreds of years. I'll name them for you. Paul and Felix Warburg, Otto H. Kahn, Louis Marburg, Henry Morgenthau, Jacob and Mortimer Schiff, Herbert Lehman, you've heard of Lehman Brothers and Lehman House. All of these people tied in with the great Rothschild family in Europe. The banking conglomerate cartel that would represent what we refer to in the scriptures as the eighth beast of the book of Revelation, the final beast system. That system which will in involve controlling all of the finances of all of the peoples of the world. 
And ain't that happening right now? Yes, it is. In 1921, the top mouthpiece for Woodrow Wilson, a man named Edward Mandel House, ladies and gentlemen. That was his name, Edward Mandel House. He, being a Cainite of the tribe, the seed line of Cain, was the top banana to Woodrow Wilson. And he was the one who got the Council on Foreign Relations, as it's called, established in this country, 1921. And by six years later, it was the Rockefeller family that started directly financing the Council on Foreign Relations and made it the most powerful and influential front group for the Canaanites in America. Powerful in ways that you can't even begin to imagine. Yes, indeed, the purpose of the Council was to create and condition the American people to accept what Edward Mandel House called a, quote, positive foreign policy, meaning one of interventionism as opposed to isolationism or neutrality. This so-called positive foreign policy created an opposition to a negative foreign policy, meaning that the people themselves, the American people, would never be the same in world affairs. They would have their freedom taken from them, their children taken from them, their children's children, and yes, today, their great-grandchildren. In war after war after war, to satisfy the greedy lusts of these bankster gangsters and their family, their offspring. That's what happened in the 1920s, during the time when the Federal Reserve System had been creating an incredible expansion of the money supply. And don't forget, most of that was to pay for the war, World War I. Little did the average American know that just a few short years later, after the establishment of this Federal Reserve monstrosity in 1913, the central bank privately owned that a war would be coming their way that would guarantee profits to these banks that own the Federal Reserve, and following that war, a Great Depression. My, oh, my. They follow like night follows day, my friend. And then, this Council on Foreign Relations in America would be set up to create various front groups. The Committee for Economic Development, the Foreign Policy Association, the World Policy Association, made up of people who were the higher-ups in academe, scholars, intellectuals, people like that, who would be able to be used with the finance and the money of the Rothschild family, the Warburgs, the Mellons, and yes, the Guggenheim Foundation as well, to create and condition a mindset in the American people to accept a new way of life in America, totally the opposite of our founding father's way. A non-interventionist policy they gave us, stay out of European affairs, they told us, and now it would be no more. Now we would be permanently intertwined in the affairs of Europe, a Europe that was divided and at war for 2,000 years in Ternicene warfare. And now we have the banking empire, the eighth beast of revelation emerging for the last 250 years of the Rothschild family, the Red Shield family, that would control the banking interests of the world ultimately. That is why today your dollar will not buy you very much, because it is not a legal dollar. It is a bogus dollar created by a false institution known as the Fed. There would be no economic malaise that we're experiencing today vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, vis-a-vis -vis employment, if it were not for this institution, the Fed. As we've seen in recent years with George Bush, handing the torch over to Obama, then not only is no change, but in fact things are getting progressively worse. This Federal Reserve System, which has had many, many, many chairmen, virtually all of them have been Kenites, Jews, right from the beginning, from Warburg on. 
this Federal Reserve System is now in the process of garnishing industries across the political and economic landscape, taking over businesses and industries and ultimately deciding who will survive and who will perish. We know that GM, Chrysler, we've seen what's happened to them. This is just the beginning, my friends. The idea and the goal was established many, 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 many years ago with the Council on Foreign Relations. This Council on Foreign Relations, as I said, has totally penetrated the very counter of American control to the point where recently when the incident involving Kim Jong-il in North Korea releasing two, quote, reporters back to the West and the intervention of William Clinton and some of his Hollywood buddies, the Council on Foreign Relations was trotted out by the news media and quoted as a, quote, legitimate source of analysis. Little does the average person know today Little do they know that the Council on Foreign Relations, which only recently has existed, according to the so-called mainstream media, has been at the forefront of every new war, every new international aggression on the part of the United States or on the part of our enemies. The Council on Foreign Relations has been the controlling factor of American politicians, from Wilson to the corrupt Roosevelt administration, which got us into war through the back door. Eisenhower was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So was Richard Milhouse Nixon. Every single administration has been staffed. Their cabinet has been run by key members of the Council on Foreign Relations. And yet the media has only recently admitted that the Council on Foreign Relations does in fact exist. Why even Rush Limbaugh, who is bought and paid for by these corrupt internationalists, admitted, yes, there is a CFR, after having told us it was the boogeyman of the imagination of far right-wing conspiracy theorists. <laughs> well, now the cat's out of the bag. How is that possible, you say, for all of this to be kept from the American public? You have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, the only way this can happen is by a bought and paid for corrupt media. The media, the major media, from NBC, the National Baloney Company, to CBS, the Communist Broadcasting Company, ABC, the Antichrist Broadcasting Company, Fox News, all of them, CNN, have to a large, heavy degree controlling interests. Any reporter any anchor who takes a detour in the path of this process of deception and begins to speak as I'm speaking today will be summarily dismissed and fired. It's just that simple. They will be off the air. We've seen that happen. We've seen that happen. Don't forget, it was Walter Durante from the New York Times who went to the Soviet Union in the 1920s and was told to go to the Soviet Union to promote Russia and Sovietism, as Walter Cronkite did later, to paint a rosy picture of Joseph Stalin, to pretend there was no ethnic cleansing, no Holocaust of the Ukrainian people. The New York Times sent him there to lie. And that was just the beginning for the New York Times. We saw the same thing through the war years of World War II, the biggest lie of all. And then in the 50s, we saw the Herbert Matthews reporters and correspondents who wrote about how wonderful this man Fidel Castro was. He was called the Robin Hood of the Sierra Maestras, ladies and gentlemen. And yet he was another media liar. We saw the same thing all throughout these ages. We saw it in the 80s with the reporters laying down with the communist guerrillas in El Salvador. We saw it, yes, indeed, with Iraq and Judith Miller. Oh, how we were lied to about Iraq. Oh, how we heard the stories and read the stories about this terrible man, Saddam Hussein, Israel's enemy once again. 
We were lied to then. We were lied to in the 1930s and 20s. And yes, we're still being lied to. And now you have to understand that this is not the beginning of lies, but it goes way back in history. Let me give you an example. There was a movement in the Congress of the United States on the part of some patriotic congressman. One of them was a Democrat, believe it or not. His name was Congressman Cox, C-O-X. No, not Archibald Cox. This man was Congressman E.E. E. Cox, a Democrat from Georgia, who in August of 1951 introduced a resolution in the House asking for a committee to conduct a, quote, thorough investigation of tax-exempt foundations. Congressman Cox said some of these foundations were indeed subverting America. He said they operated in the field of social reform and international relations, and many have brought down on themselves harsh and just condemnation. He named names. One of them was the Rockefeller Foundation, which, as we said, financed the movement and growth of the Council on Foreign Relations in 1927. It was the Rockefellers who donated the land upon which the United Nations sits. And he went on to expose these organizations, like the Guggenheim Foundation. And he listed the Carnegie Corporation, the Rosenwald Fund, and other foundations saying, there are disquieting evidence that at least a few of these foundations have permitted themselves to be infiltrated by men and women who are disloyal to our American way of life. They should be investigated and exposed to the pitless light of publicity, and appropriate legislation should be framed to correct this situation. Congressman Cox's resolution in 1951 proposing to investigate these subversive institutions, Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, tax exempt, with interlocking relations to the Council on Foreign Relations, died in committee, that resolution. On March of 1952, Cox introduced the same resolution again because he had mentioned the foundation support from Langston Hughes, a Negro communist. And because he mentioned Langston Hughes, Many in this controlled, Kenite controlled media began to attack him as being a racist because he had criticized the Rosenwald Foundation for making grants to known communists. He was called an anti Semite. But the Cox Resolution did, in fact, get adopted in 1952, despite the opposition. And the Cox Committee to investigate tax exempt foundations was set up. Unfortunately, Congressman Cox died before the end of that year under mysterious circumstances. And the final report of his committee, filed on January 1st of 1953, was nothing more than a pathetic whitewash of what he had done. Now, a Republican-controlled Congress, this was the 83rd Congress, came into existence in January of 1953 the so-called Eisenhower era, the, the, quote, good Republicans. I like Ike. Another great deception before the American public. Remember, Eisenhower was distinguished as an absolute traitor in World War II by none other than General Patton. General Patton had Eisenhower's number. Eisenhower was in direct contact with the Soviet Union during World War II, even before he contacted his superiors in Washington, allowing the Soviets to take Berlin, allowing them to enslave all of Eastern and Central Europe. Eisenhower supervised the notorious program of, of bringing back to the Soviet gulags to death men and women, but mostly men, who had fought for freedom, they thought. Operation Keelhauled. That's what it was. Eisenhower was responsible for the merciless bombing, along with Churchill, bombing campaign in Berlin, in Germany, and yes, we also know of the infamous camps 
in which millions of Germans were literally starved to death. German soldiers, but also German civilians. Eisenhower would be a good president then, wouldn't he? No one knew of this at the time. Eisenhower ignored questions from people. So this Congress, the Eisenhower Congress, the so-called Clean Republican Congress, the 83rd Congress in 1953 came into being. And yes, there were great, patriotic, courageous men in Congress. We know of Joe McCarthy and how he took it upon himself to wage a war against the administration itself, the corrupt Eisenhower administration, for the fact that Eisenhower's administration was in fact covering up for communist penetration within the circles of the United States government. Not just the Army, but the State Department and right down the alphabet list of agencies. This was borne out by the fact that FBI investigations were not being pursued, though they had enough evidence to show widespread communist penetration of the Eisenhower government from the days of Roosevelt and Truman. Well, there was another congressman like the McCarthy's and the Cox's. He was a Republican. His name was Congressman Carol Reese. He was a Republican from Tennessee. He introduced a resolution proposing a committee to carry on the unfinished business of the defunct Cox Committee. And what he found out was indeed that he would be able to set up a, tax, a committee that would be a subcommittee of that main committee to investigate these tax-exempt foundations connected to the Council on Foreign Relations. <coughs> well, what did he find out? At the time, the head of the Ford Foundation came before that subcommittee and boldly proclaimed that he and his foundation had been working to reduce the standard and the lifestyle of America while helping to raise the status of the third world and communist enslaved world to the point where someday we might be comfortably merged into a one world system. Well, when he said that, jaws dropped. And the congressman said, would you repeat those words before the full Congress of the United States? And he said, absolutely not. And yet it was entered into the congressional record. Congressman Reese's committee was done away with by 1955. He was beginning to step on some pretty fat toes. That committee did a lot of good work. So did the Senate Investigating Committee under McCarthy, investigating communism and treason in the Eisenhower administration. And there was plenty of that, to be sure. My friends, I don't have enough time to expose all of the lies, the deceptions, the media disinformation, the propaganda, all of these things that have befallen America over the last century. But suffice it to say, where many of you laughed before, I hear very little laughter now. And the reason is because now it's getting to the point where America is at that crossroad, spoken of by this head of the Ford Foundation in 1953 before that committee. America someday will have her standard of living reduced way down. And our enemies, particularly the communists, the slave states, the collectivist nations, whether right or left, it didn't matter. The third world nations would be brought up until there is a convenient merger, what they call convergence. Convergence, okay? That's what it's all about. How do you do that? Well, they're doing it right now. I just told you last week, your jobs are disappearing, never to return again. Don't be deceived. Oh, there'll be plenty of financial jobs. There will be plenty of jobs in the, quote, high-tech industry in certain aspects of our states. There will be a number of positions that will involve retail and selling. Those always have to be here. But they ain't hard paying. They ain't going to be lucrative positions. And the, and the 401ks and the pension plans and all of that, bye-bye. These nice little Kenites 
I'm talking about these children of Cain today who run the banking system, who call themselves Jews, and indeed are not of the tribes of Israel. They're of the enemy tribes of Israel. These are the Kenites, the Amalekites, all of the kites as we call them. Indeed, these are the people who are literally running the banking system of the world. Communist occupied China has been their baby. That's why when McCarthy exposed the fact that Owen Lattimore and people like him were running the State Department, were responsible for the betrayal of China, mainland China, to the communist butcher Mao Zedong. They attacked Joe McCarthy just as they attacked Douglas MacArthur for saying essentially the same thing. MacArthur was fired by Truman for wanting to win a war that was never meant to be won. And guess who replaced him? You know who replaced him? General Ridgway. And General Ridge Ridgway just happened to be a member <laughs> of the Council on Foreign Relations. Now you know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. Yes, indeed, my friends, I've given you a thumbnail, bird's eye view of exactly how America is controlled from politics, Congress. Yes, indeed, the White House has been controlled right from the beginning. Obama's no exception. And particularly the media. None of this deception would ever have been allowed to exist had it not been for the widespread control at the very apex of these media conglomerates. We can name the names for you. We can tell you about them. From William S. Paley to David Sarnoff, we can name them now. Iger at Disney, all of these people. Look at the families. All of them are of one essential tribe. Whether it's the Newhouse family, whether it's the Bloomberg family, Rupert Murdoch, who owns media on four continents, all of them have one thing in common. They are run primarily by the same families, the same tribes. And all of them can exert enormous control over the entire media landscape so that you know only what they wish you to know. And what they don't want you to know, you will never see on any of these networks. Whether it's Fox, the so-called right-wing conservative news network, or whether it's CNN, or whether it's ABC, NBC, CBS, MSNBC, go right down the line. My friends, it's all the same. That's why you're not waking up. That's why the deception will grow until there's nothing left in your wallet, there's no food on the table, and war will come to America as surely as I'm sitting here today. We are under captivity, and God said it in his word. The true Israel, the true seed line of Jacob, the true seed line of the Adamic people and the house of Israel would come right down from Jacob all the way down to this age and the bad figs planted in Jerusalem in 1948 would be the reason for worldwide one world beast control the eighth beast of revelation my friends it's coming here today you won't hear this from your preachers they wouldn't dare tell you the truth if they knew it they're 501c3 tax exempt churches run by the government my friends, and I see the clock telling me it's time to go. We have to end the program right now for lack of time, but you join us again next week. Again, same time, same station for another fascinating and frightening program of The Deadly Experiment. Till then, Rick Adams, your producer and host this week, saying Yahweh bless his elect.